Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, here we start our second Friday morning session with the keynote speech from a colleague of ours, um, a Slovenian dramaturg who now for years have been has been teaching, living and teaching in <clears throat> Halifax, Nova Scotia, and Canada. Uh, his name is Jure Gantar, and um, well, whenever we sort of need Jure to support us, to buttress us with you know his profound theatrical knowledge, we turn to him and ask for support and help. And today we are going to get his interesting talk on the death of the character in post-dramatic comedy. So Jure, the floor is yours and we are looking forward to listening to you. Here we go. The summer of 2008, the Drama Review, one of the most prestigious scholarly journals in its field, published a comprehensive assessment of the recent English translation of Hans T. Lehmann's book post-dramatic theatre. The fact that it was entrusted to an academic heavyweight, Yale University professor Eleanor Fuchs, who is herself quoted several times in Lehmann's book, is probably the best indication of the importance that TDR's editors placed on the publication. Yet Fuchs didn't approach her task with the respect one might have expected given the reputation of Lehmann's study. Her review systematically dismantles Lehmann's argument, methodology and style and goes as far as to suggest that post-dramatic theatre has the peculiar fate of being both prophetic and behind the times. She finds Lehmann both too circumspect and not decisive enough. What is the post-dramatic post? she asks and continues with another question. Might we then expect a return to the text after all? Considering the extent of Fuchs's disapproval, it is somewhat ironic that Lehmann and Fuchs actually share the same methodological starting point. They both base their analyses of contemporary theatre on rejecting the traditional Aristotelian definition which favours text over all other elements of performance. But while Lehmann claims that the most important feature of post-dramatic theatre is a renunciation of plot, Fuchs, in her book The Death of Character, Perspectives on Theatre After Modernism, sees the disappearance of character as more significant. According to Fuchs, neither modern nor postmodern theatre depends on self-reflective subjectivity. Instead, they both actively attempt to destabilize and subvert the subject to the degree that the audience can no longer see it as a continuous self. Lehmann and Fuchs have one other methodological feature in common. Their theories rely almost exclusively on what could provisionally be called serious productions and ignore nearly all forms of theatre whose main objective is to make their audiences laugh. This disregard doesn't necessarily mean that either Lehmann's or Fuchs's hypotheses are fundamentally flawed, but it does imply that they are incomplete and that they should be tested on further examples. Since productions aiming for laughter are just as present and popular today as they were in the past, surely any thorough examination of contemporary theatre should at least attempt to account for comedy too. And this is precisely what I will try to determine in this paper. Using Fuchs rather than Lehmann as the foundation of my terminological and methodological framework, simply because her argument is epistemologically more decisive than his, I will try to describe how comedy has responded to the changes in theatrical practice since the decline of modernism. The main question I'm going to ask myself in the next few minutes is whether character also disappears from post-dramatic comedy and not just from post-dramatic serious theatre. I will focus on three forms of postmodern comedy that deviate from the traditional narrative format 
and seem to support Fox's reading. On sketch, stand-up, and improvisational comedy. Since postmodern theatre is characterized by the vanishing boundaries between high and popular culture, most of my examples come from the popular part of the spectrum, rather than from what criticism usually considers high literature. The main body of the argument will therefore test the cogency of basic tenets of Fuchs's theory using examples from sketch comedy beyond the fringe, George Carlin stand-up acts, and the Second City improvisations. The second part of the paper, on the other hand, will offer a counter-argument and conclude with a possible supplement to Fuchs's hypotheses. The most obvious post-dramatic mutation of comedy is probably sketch comedy. The main reason for this is that sketch comedy is no longer fixated on individual subjectivity, which, according to Fuchs, has been the principal goal of drama since the time of German idealism. The notion of dramatic character as the only artistic vehicle that could give material form to absolute spiritual subjectivity was first introduced by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, but reached its peak in realism, where it was understood primarily in terms of its psychological depth and complexity. By the end of the 19th century, however, modernist playwrights such as August Strindberg and Maurice Maeterlinck started to move away from it, until in 20th century non-realist theater thought began to assume a newly dominant dramaturgical position, shadowed by the slightly Aristotelian category of spectacle. A paradigmatic example of how this new genre operates is the legendary 1960s sketch comedy Beyond the Fringe, created jointly by the Cambridge University Footlights Dramatic Club and the Oxford Review. While both student groups regularly staged their productions for the general public and were satirical in their outlook from their inception, Beyond the Fringe nevertheless represented a qualitative leap from the usual sophomoric humor and tongue-in-cheek lampooning to the thoroughly anti-establishment bent and anarchic structure. Alan Bennett, Peter Cook, Jonathan Miller, and Dudley Moore's loosely connected and non-linear comic sketches may have been a logical extension of their earlier student reviews, but as a whole they far exceeded the sum of its parts and became a historical turning point in the post-war British satire boom. With its radical abandonment of narrative continuity, and integrated fictional identities, Beyond the Fringe indeed appears to offer a new postmodern alternative to traditional comedy. In the published version of the sketches, the speakers are referred to by their performers' names, Peter, John, Alan and Dudley, rather than by the name of the character they play. This practice is used even when they temporarily adopt another identity, for instance, when John becomes Vicar Dick, or when Peter mimics British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. If the recordings of the actual production of Beyond the Fringe can be trusted, this kind of an approach results in the dismantling of the mere idea of a unified self. The four performers move from one stereotype to another in a seamless manner, sometimes splitting the lines belong to a single voice, and at other times switching from one persona to another in a matter of seconds. The impression of the perfect fluidity of characterization is further reinforced by a total lack of any character development. Because the structure of Beyond the Fringe is so episodic, with each sketch fully independent of the others, no single enacted figure has the chance of being fleshed out. Peter's Mr. Charles Spedding of Hoxton comes up through a trapdoor, delivers a speech in which he reminisces about the declaration of World War II, 
and then exits in the same way, never to be seen again, no matter how much the audience may care about what happens to him next. Another Charles, Charles P. Moody, conversely doesn't even appear on the stage, though he is at least mentioned several times. The only bond between the fragments in Beyond the Fringe were the four performers themselves, but they were dressed so similarly that they occasionally appear to be interchangeable. Perhaps Dudley, who also sang, was slightly distinct from the other three. Yet even he didn't really change through the play. All this is, of course, a major departure from traditional comic characters, who may be flawed, but are always consistent in their foibles, and who may not grow, but at least fluctuate in their dramatic status. The second type of post-dramatic comic theatre that deserves a closer scrutiny is stand-up comedy, with its most unique feature an innate theatrical self-reflexivity. Fuchs describes it as a mode of self-observing consciousness which operates at the level of the character's canny awareness of their own role-playing. The main example that she uses to illustrate this notion is David Cole's 1979 chamber epic The Moments of the Wandering Jew. As is the case in so many other postmodern mysteriums, in Cole's play, the symbolic and abstracted everyman figure only exists as an actor in his own play. In other words, the protagonist of The Moments of the Wandering Jew is no longer only decentered, but also stripped of all his psychological attributes and fully theatricalized. In stand-up comedy, stand-up comedians can be seen as the contemporary equivalents of such medieval allegorical characters. They are a de facto postmodern everyman or mankind. Their goal is to become so universal that every audience member will be able to relate to them. Meanwhile, the ubiquitous presence of a microphone foregrounds the theatrical nature of their act. It reminds both the comedians and the audience that what they're witnessing, despite the ostensible intimacy and authenticity of the confessional format, is ultimately still a performance and not life itself. The suggestion that stand-up comedy is a subgenre of post-dramatic theatre is further reinforced if we remember that according to Philip Auslander, stand-up comedy is not a narrative form. There is no situation to surround and contain the actions of the comic. Instead, Auslander continues, stand-up comedy is monologic. The comedian stands alone unmediated by other characters. There is no George for every Gracie, no Ricky for every Lucy. If Lehman is correct when he observes in his analysis of common post-dramatic strategies that a monologue as a speech that has the audience as its addressee intensifies communication, then stand-up comedy amplifies communication to the point where all the limits between the medium and the message have been erased. In this case, life and fiction are inseparable, which also means that the traditional category of character has become obsolete. The most post-dramatic of all stand-up comedies is probably George Carlin's infamous routine, The Seven Words You Can Never Say on Television. Unlike several of the other tracks on the album Class Clown, on which this routine was first recorded, the seven words lacks a clear autobiographical dimension. While the views presented are still presumably the speakers, any details about his own personality or experiences are absent. In fact, the structure of Carlin's routine is much closer to a high school public speaking assignment than to a typical stand-up anecdote. Here is the beginning of Carlin's text, 
as delivered on May 27, 1972 in Santa Monica, California. I love words. I thank you for hearing my words. I want to tell you something about words that I think is important. I love that I say they are my work, they are my play, they are my passion. Words are all we have, really. We have thoughts, but thoughts are fluid. As you can see, there is no attempt to be funny in the first six sentences. Instead, Carlin articulates a sensible and insightful position to which few spectators or listeners could object. The first moment of comic deflation follows the pause after the word fluid, but the first of the seven transgressive words is not heard until almost a minute and a half into the seven-minute spiel. The overall effect of Carlin's routine is very much in line with Fuchs's description of what happens with character in postmodern theatre. The subject retreats behind the pure objectivity of words and sacrifices its individuality through the process of deconstruction of language as the established limit of our thought. The very end of Carlin's monologue in particular, with its analysis of two-way or double-meaning words, you can prick your finger but don't finger your prick, in a curious way reminds us of the verbal gymnastics typical of French post-structuralists. In Carlin's stand-up comedy, just like in Jacques Derrida's philosophy, metaphysical presence is undermined by theatrical presence until it reduces the character to a speaker in front of a brick wall. The last of post-dramatic comic genres that I'm going to mention in this paper is improvisational comedy. Here too Fuchs's study provides a convenient theoretical explanation of the genre's contribution to the dissolution of character. Inspired by Artaud's rejection of the masterpiece and by Grotowski's training, she writes, many theaters came to regard the author's script as an element of political oppression in the theatrical process, demanding submission to external authority. The alternative to such an oppression was what Fuchs calls the extempore speech, that is, the unrehearsed lines which express the performance subjectivity rather than demanding submission to external authority. Such a dialogue is particularly important in improvisational comedy proper, especially as developed by two leading Chicago companies, the Compass Players and its successor, the Second City. Under Paul Sills's guidance, both companies successfully put into practice his mother Viola Spolin's theater games theories. The Second City style of improv, as this variation is often called, differs most noticeably from its famous predecessor Commedia dell'arte in that the final segment of the Second City's typical performance abandons any script or prepared material and instead relies for its plotting and characterization entirely on the audience's suggestions. As their former artistic director Del Close notes, the Second City audiences often attend their productions precisely because they want to observe the results of their own interaction with the performers. When one of the Second City's early shows closed with an opera improvised on an audience suggestion of Grimm Brothers' fairy tale, for example, the spectators who gave the performers the seemingly impossible challenge experienced a twofold pleasure. They enjoyed both the performers' quickness of mind and ingenuity and the creative potential of their own idea. The unpredictability of the audience's interventions, however, has an unusual consequence. It causes the fundamental instability of Second City characters. Though the company normally decides in advance how each fictional figure will behave and rehearses various directions in which an actor could take the character during the actual improvisation, a live audience can derail even the best of plans. Nia Vardalos, for example, was called Thunder Thighs 
during the improv set in a Toronto performance. Her response to a comment about the size of her legs was certainly not a part of her rehearsed character. She took the microphone, walked into the audience, made the heckler stand up and said, let's take a look at your body. Everything that she did after that moment was a departure from her original character. And no matter what she said afterwards, her lines were perceived as more assertive and edgier. Fuchs argues in her study that the interest in the psychological depth and substantiality of character declined toward the end of the 19th century and suggests that this has led to a gradual move away from character-generated dramaturgies. The result of this change is that postmodern theatre no longer focuses on questions of identity and is instead far more interested in an exploration and playing out of difference. My analysis so far confirms Fuchs's views. Sketch comedy dismantles the notion of a unified self. Stand-up blurs the border between the real and the fictional, while improv destabilizes subjectivity itself. In other words, everything seems to indicate that character is dying out in post-dramatic comedy too. There is only one dissenting voice from this view, that of the comedians themselves. They still appear to approach their comedies through the lens of character. Cook's Minor, for instance, appears in a single sketch in Beyond the Fringe. And should as such be a perfect example of a dislocated postmodern figure. Yet he ended up evolving into one of the most original and well defined comic characters of British post war comedy, the wonderfully dull and pompous E.L. Whisty. In a similar manner, Carlin's second most popular stand up routine, Al Sleet, your hippy dippy weatherman revolves around a carefully crafted character of a well-natured but spaced out hippie Al Sleet. As a matter of fact, Carlin's repertoire includes a whole range of other assumed identities and is rarely, if ever, fully depersonalized. And the same is true of the Second City's performance poetics. More than 60 years after the company was first established, their advertisement for the current production of Noisy Maroon still promises a long-form, character-driven improv and even assures its spectators that all improvisers will be one character inspired by audience suggestion for the duration of the show. No matter how hard they try to distance themselves from the past, Postmodern comedians are clearly still resorting to fictional and psychologically motivated characters in their performances. Why is this the case? How is it that comedy can't follow serious theater and reject tradition? Does this mean comedy can never be truly post-dramatic? The first potential answer to these questions is that comedy as a genre tends to be cautious, not so much in terms of its selection of suitable targets as in its choice of dramaturgical and theatrical strategies that it employs to achieve its effect. Because comedy depends for its success on a very tangible audience response, laughter, it wants to ensure a maximum level of understanding and is therefore far more reluctant to experiment with its means of expression than other forms of theater where interpretive uncertainty and ambiguity are often seen as values. Hanging on to the tradition is, in this sense, the lesser and the safer of the two evils. Rather than a taste for nostalgia, it indicates a healthy degree of performative pragmatism. But there exists one other hypothetical explanation. It is also possible to argue 
that the comic character has survived any attempt to abolish it, because it is precisely its unstable identity, inadequate authenticity, or ambiguous individuality, that is, the main objectives of its deconstruction which make it comic. In other words, characters are considered comic when they fail to become autonomous and unified subjects. Or, to take the statement even further, any bid to challenge character as an independent dramatic entity inevitably makes it comic. Let me demonstrate how this works in practice, using examples from the same three subgenres of comedy that I have been discussing earlier in this paper. The curious choral sketch bred alone from beyond the fringe should have been a perfect case of the loss of individual identity in postmodern comedy. Though the names of two of the four bar guests in the sketch are specified, Squiffy and Buffy, these are such generic public school nicknames that they don't really help the audience distinguish between the very similar members of the group. This impression is further confirmed by the fact that much of the scene is delivered with a variety of incomprehensible hums and ahems and other human noises, rather than with words, which is exactly what Fox admires in Antonin Artaud's Theatre of Cruelty. Yet, instead of responding to this visceral experience of the unlimited, stripped bare, sacred self with awe, the audience reacts to the four performers mumbling with roars of laughter. From the spectator's point of view, the vague identity of the guests, whose only distinguishing feature is their choice of drink, Peter orders large whiskey, John double brandy, Dudley glass of vino tinti, and Alan rosé, can be explained simply as a logical materialization of their spiritual vacuity. There are four people on the stage, but they share one thoroughly predictable and one-sided character. And since they have been stripped of all noticeable differences, the only legitimate way to respond to their blank identities is with giggling. In Carlin's case, his attempt to depersonalize the speaker of seven words and make him factual rather than fictional has an unforeseen corollary. Though the main target of Carlin's ridicule is the absent and possibly hypocritical censor, who indirectly claims to represent the interest of respectable middle-class Americans, a speaker so preoccupied with the seven words that he can't move on to the next topic himself ceases to appear real. In his persistent fascination with swearing, he is almost as funny as the moralistic television producers who have decided to ignore the vernacular of the world surrounding them. Carlin's anger at the society may not quite reach the point where it could be considered what traditional scholarship of comedy calls monomania or obsession but it does make him, too, worthy of the audience's glee. The relationship between theatrical deconstruction and the survival of comic character is probably even easier to see in the Second City productions, where the rehearsal process is gradual and often well recorded. We can occasionally retrace all the steps in the genesis of an iconic character there. Martin Short's nerd Ed Grimley, for example, started when he took over a role in the sketch Sexist in the review entitled The Wizard of Ossington. Because Short could hardly be more different than John Candy, who originally performed the role of a chauvinist moron, he had to address the challenge with the help of an entirely different set of improvisations and rehearsal discoveries. Grimley's idiotic grinning, for instance, was imported from an unrelated scene. I was doing the piece with Robin Duke and Peter Aykroyd, Short recollects. 
I remember one time I looked at Robin and she was downstage. I kind of bared my teeth by accident. The audience laughed. My tendency when they laugh is to freeze and figure out what I've done later. So that teeth bearing became part of the character. In other words, an actor's mistake turned into an essential character feature. Grimley's exaggeratedly pointy hairdo too was an extension of the actor's mannerism. Short originally gelled his hair to make Grimley look more fashionable. But once one of his scene partners pointed out the ridiculousness of the shape, the hair became a reflection of the character's silly personality. In neither case was the source of inspiration psychological or intended to convey the essence of a fictional figure. Rather, a character emerged out of coincidental moments and was a result of a process privileging play and not mimesis. The dorky Ed Grimley didn't evolve into a well-rounded comic figure despite all the attempts to make him less realistic, but because of them. Just like sketch or stand-up comedy, improvisational comedy appears to demonstrate that the post-dramatic approach does very little to affect the dominant position of character in comic dramaturgy. At the same time, all three forms of post-dramatic comedy repeatedly underline parallels between postmodernism as a historical period and comedy as a genre. Does this mean then that at least in theory, all postmodern characters could be seen as comic? This may sound like a sweeping and superficial generalization but let us not forget that critics have regularly described postmodernism in terms of its parodic relationship with modernism and speak of the governing role of irony in postmodernism. Metatheater, especially, can't avoid gravitating towards laughter, no matter how serious the subject of the plays. The practice of postmodern theater of course doesn't quite support this suggestion. First, there are many coherent characters in some of the best-known postmodern plays who are decidedly unfunny. Second, not all parodies are comic, and at least one form of irony has been present in tragedy since Sophocles. And finally, Propensity for comedy in postmodern drama doesn't necessarily make every single character funny. A more nuanced explanation of the curious affinity between comedy and postmodernism, which also accounts for the persistence of comic character in post-dramatic theater, might be that there is no concerted effort to abolish character in postmodernism after all. The great majority of all attempts to eliminate or replace it took place in modernism and postmodernism simply highlights their failure, especially in its comedies. Because it does this through appropriation and subsequent subversion of the methods of modernist deconstruction of individual subjectivity, these methods have now often become associated with postmodernism rather than with modernism where they originated. Yet they primarily exist in postmodern theater as a comic device, working to make a character amusing rather than superfluous. Their main value is in ensuring that comic characters can also exhibit ontological and not only moral vices. In this sense, postmodern comedy is a clear proof that character has survived the transition to the post-dramatic theater and is there to stay. I'm just glad that Fuchs isn't here to hear me say this.
having made you erroneously made you think that we were going to listen to Yule live, mm. unfortunately. But of course, at 4:30 in the morning, it's a little bit difficult for him to appear in the in Lublin. He did that yesterday. He told me he drove for an hour to be there at 4:30 in mm. his office. So he did once. He did it once, not not twice. Right? And for all I know, now we are going to have the live appearances. So this is the trim, right? First by our Polish. She's joining us now. No, she's joining us now. Uh, you you yeah. For questions? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. For okay. It's still quite early in the morning. Okay, good. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Good. Okay, so I... Um, Ja sam tukaj na zvezi, sam ma, je nekdo drug. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. I have Karolina Prikovski's screen on. So she has to probably sh stop sharing. There we go. So uh, thank you, Jure, for the for for your lecture, uh, and we have already the question from the audience. Uh, Lada Charle Feldman will pose the question. I will repeat it to you because um, I don't think you will hear it, or you can come. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for a very very interesting and very inspiring lecture. As someone who is um, cultivating a lifelong interest in meta theater, of course, I was immediately um, stimulated by your comment that uh, meta theatricality necessarily goes into a comic direction. And it is, of course, um, I understand why you are saying that, but you, I'm, I'm sure that you are aware that, in fact, the term meta-theater was inaugurated by Lionel Abel in connection with the tragedy. So I would like you to comment upon that a little bit, because it it's always puzzles me whether, whether, it's, whether we can ascribe a certain genre to meta-theatrical procedures, or whether we should stick to, you know, Consider it just a strategy, which can be used for um, both purposes, let's say, to cry and to laugh. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, um, that's an excellent point. Um, it's funny. The, the earliest example of meta theater I can think of, I'm pretty sure that is the, uh, the earliest one, is from... I guess, no, you have them in Euripides too, but the one that was mentioned yesterday in The Frogs. So you do, yeah, Aristophanes. So you have him, and even later on, if you're thinking, for instance, of what's happening in Elizabethan drama with, uh, uh, with Shakespeare and so on, it tends to be funny, even if it appears in tragedies. So, and the best probably example of how it can backfire and uh, gravitate towards... Um, towards comedy is Brecht. In, in Brecht's case, no matter how he tries, for instance, the, the Fau effect, the, um, uh, the alienation effect, um, tends to make the audiences laugh. We are conditioned to be realistic. I was actually um, um, so pleased to hear the morning conversation where the new generation is consciously returning back. And I think we see that trend throughout history. We have attempts to distance it, but ultimately, the criterion, the actors are always thinking in terms of, of psychological characters, even before psychology itself is invented. But you're right, actually, Abel was um, um, thinking of, of, uh, of, of tragedy. Yeah. A, a good idea. Okay, so you don't have any comment on Abel? Um, no, not, not specifically. I, um, I'm using the term here, but it's not not directly intended to to address that. I was I was thinking more in terms of of Lehman and and um, folks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the question. Any other comments, questions? No. Uh, 
Um, I was wondering, uh, could you comment a little bit more on the uh, autoreferentiality or in the comedy? Because in, in the postmodern theater, you didn't take uh, took Lehmann as your starting point, but nevertheless, this um, uh, this thinking of of how the, the 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 text will be staged is inscribed in the text itself. How is it with comedy? You you've shown some examples how the characters uh, is fragmented, but I didn't see the this autoreferentiality. Uh, in it. Yeah, the um, there but it can and probably be traced back to early modern theater. The earliest examples would be probably Commedia dell'arte that we know. I mean, it could po possibly have happened earlier, but we know that in Commedia dell'arte, some of the best known characters are actually named um, after assumed identities of the actors. They are synonymous with the actor. The example I usually give for that is if you think of uh, typical North American comedy, um, um, sitcom, um, the characters will have the actor's name no matter what um, um, sitcom they appear in. There is um, like the, uh, I don't know which ones are known in, in uh, which ones have been shown in Slovenia or not, but Seinfeld, for instance, is mm -hmm. called Seinfeld so that you, you have easier time relating. But there, Roseanne Barr, for instance, was called Roseanne in different shows. Um, that makes it easier to do that. And you have the same autoreferential uh, auto element probably as uh, um, afterwards in uh, Moliere. Um, yesterday, uh, Pete spoke about um, uh, La Reprise, and in um, Moliere you have, for instance, uh, the impromptus, um, improvisatias, so you have uh, improvisation at Versailles where the characters are named with, uh, uh, he's written, in the play written for, for members of his company. So you have that very specific element and that makes you feel safer. In principle, it's hard to laugh. You can only laugh if you essentially disagree with someone. But if someone says, this is me, I'm funny and I agree to be made fun of, then it's easier. So that, that continues. So autoreferentiality, even in serious um, plays is, is hard to take with a straight face, very easy to parody in some of the examples. Um, I don't know if, if anyone has read, I think it, I want, I'm trying to figure out if it has been ever staged in Slovenia. Um, Christian Dietrich Grabes play, um, Don Juan, what's it called? The, uh, no, the deeper irony, deeper meaning or whatever. Um, he appears as a character at the end of his play. So how do you do a play in which the playwright is supposed to show up on the stage? That that's probably and it's it's inevitably ends up. There were experiments, but I think it inevitably ends up leaning towards laughter. The audience has a hard time treating it any in in any other way. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yes. The other, the other microphone works. The microphone that the, the um, Lada and Gaspar just used, I can hear well. Uh, hi, Juritz. <laughs> my question, one question for my uh, my part here. You were talking about three different kinds of, let's say, meta theater, right? That you uh, mentioned today, and you bound. Um, the forms of it also, as if I understood correctly, to actually their results, which is the comic. And it is, if I understood correctly, it is actually the results that, if not evaluate, but that give value to what actually is being done. And you discuss this, this way of being done. So my question would be, since also it, the result of comedy as such, or as a more structured text, should be also the same, does that or would that pertain and, and, and be valid also for comedy? Or could you, or could one expand what your argument also to a, let's say, more classical, under quotations, of course, texts? <laughs> I mean, it's easier to make my argument applying in comedy because if you think of, for instance, potential implications to what I suggested, 
uh, it uh, could be seen as um, having dismissed the whole idea of post-dramatic theater period. Um, that the, the ultimately, you could reduce what I was saying to a French phrase, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. You know, so it's that there has been no uh, no essential uh, no essential difference. But it's also possible to argue we always assume that um, genres are somehow symmetrical. But it's also to, uh, possible to argue that um, there is essential asymmetry, that maybe comedy doesn't change, but other things do. Hard to say. I mean, I, um, I mean, part of what part of what I do is obviously not meant to be hundred percent serious. So yeah. it's uh, it, it's 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 meant to point. be it, it's meant yeah it's meant to be mockery. I mean, it's you know ho hopefully um, 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 everything does it. It's in a sense provocation. But um, on the other hand, yeah, I guess you could also argue uh, um, that it applies to um, to tragedy too. It's that, I mean, but then you, of course, have to um, dismiss all the examples that we've mentioned so far, the um, um, extreme examples of character dissolution that we have, like what I meant, the two examples that I mentioned in my comments yesterday, the back at uh, uh, Handke, mm -hmm. uh, Carol Churchill has a play in which all character names are abolished. One of the things that I uh, asked about yesterday was, for instance, the status of stage directions, the secondary text. Because we keep talking about um, uh, various texts, and that's the one that, if you think of, um, if you think of what Ingarden says, um, in Greek drama there are no stage directions in uh, our sense of the word. I usually ask my students, "What's the smallest unit of stage directions?" Eventually, someone thinks character's name. But for instance, if you take character's name out and you just have a morphous uh, list of units. Like in some productions that they've done, Puccini, I think, said that uh, the, they said about Puccini, he could put into opera anything, including a laundry list or the, the things that can you dramatize um, a phone book. Yeah, you can. You have to divide it into speakers. You have to assign it. And then all of a sudden you have a, a, a kind of a, 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 another form of, um, um, of text. So um, ultimately... It, you could probably apply um, 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 similar logic to everything, but this, you you have to start making um, um, humans. I remember that one of the things that uh, I was uh, artistic director of Glay for one year, and uh, the one project that we've done at that time, I was always very happy with was the five and a half. And I remember um, the um, um, Edward Miller did um, um, Heiner Miller's heart uh, a Herzstück. Um, there was essentially 12 lines, 45 minutes. They've never repeated them, but they established um, uh, Ostan and uh, his wife established perfect characters based on. Sorry, I'm confusing the two um, um, the two parts. Uh, but the, um, for instance, there was um, there was a perfect establishment of character with material that that offered virtually nothing. So it was just pure um, um, theatrical creativity on that basis. Yeah, you could argue that. Okay, thank you. It's a very long answer. No, that, that's good. But you made me think about, uh, let's say, waiting for Godot, right? That also works in a comical way, right? That's absolutely, and it's as serious as possible, right? Yeah. True, true. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions by any chance? I'm not sure if I'm going to ask you to ask me 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 to ask Ne smo bili, smo pod velikim odisom tudi tvoje prezentacije, to je bilo krasno posnet. Si to sam naredil ali? Ja. Ali si imel kakšno pomoč na faksu? Ja. Bravo. No, I, I, um, I, I wanted to apologize ahead of time for, uh, about the format. Is, uh, and I see that most of the, the, the younger audience members are gone, but I was hoping they'd be there, because I do that in my classes so that students can relate to it. I'm thinking it's speaks more to, um, um, I literally, my daughters are the age of the people who spoke earlier and I have them check everything that I do so that it's, um, it engages them on a, on a different level. It's not just, what I think is the worst is having a little picture in, in the corner of, of um, someone, someone going through, um, um, through the text. 
I don't know, but but of course it it may appear to be um, 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 silly too. It's Nikolai Hartmann, I think, said it's very hard to talk about comedy uh, in a serious fashion. No, not at all. I I meant it. I mean, I meant what I said. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Thanks. One more question here. Uh, hvala Jure, bo mesto slovenščine, da ne bo brez slovenščine uh, ostali. Uh, hvala za izjemno zanimivo uh, prezentacijo. Uh, zelo dobro se, super se mi zdi to uh, spravljanje v dialog Elinor Fuchs in uh, Hansa Tisa Lehmann, res izjemno produktivno se mi zdi, tako da bom šel zdaj še enkrat brati njeno to izvrstno knjigo, uh, Elinor Fuchs. Uh, moram reči, da seveda se mi zdi ta pogled na, na postdramsko v komediji izjemno zanimiv in tudi v bistvu zelo relevanten za ukvarjanje s postdramskim nasploh, ne? ali pa ne več dramskim in tako naprej. Tako da še enkrat hvala lepa in upam, da se kaj vidimo tudi v Ljubljani. Ja. Ja, se, mo, se se moram jaz tudi oglasiti, kaj se grozen krivga se počutam, ampak nam še zmeri odsvetuje um, um, potovanje. Ja. So I'm really, I'll say this in English too at the end for, for the ones of you who may not understand, although I thought it was interesting yesterday when we uh, uh, heard a conversation between a Serbian and a Croatian scholar in English. <laughs> um, yeah, it's I wish I could be there despite the tear gas. So um, I'll be with you until, uh, until, the end of, um, until the end of today, and I, I can't wait to see many of you in, in, in person in a few months when we, are, when we are hopefully back to normal. Okay, thank you, Jure. Stay with us in your, in your spirit. I'll, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll leave Zoom, so I'll be on the other one, because it's, it's much harder to hear here. So, bye, everyone. Good luck. Okay, thank you very much once again. Take care, and... Hi to, to Canada. Our next speaker is from one of the two uh, presenters from Poland. Uh, are we going to get her on the screen? She unfortunately couldn't make it to, uh, to Ljubljana. She's from Łódź. Uh -huh. Hey, hi, Karolina. Cześć, ja przejdę po prostu, będę uh, mówił po angielsku, no, żeby, po okay. żeby to tak wyglądało, inaczej pozdrawiam. Uh, she is from Łódź. Uh, uh, the teaching, of course, at the Department of Drama and Theatre at the, this respecting, respectable university. And Carolina has been quite uh, a friend of ours for a long time, and we have collaborated on a few, few projects. Today, he, she's going to talk to us about the tramad, dramaturgy of migrants, Kill the Robbers. So, Carolina, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kozak. Thank you for invita inviting me to this conference. This is the pleasure for me. And also thank you for the following research questions that tactics and strategies are used in contemporary drama in the face of social challenges. It made me reflect on problem of migrant theater, migrant drama, and I think that one day after the Nobel Prize for a representative of migrant literature, I do not have to introduce how significant as a migrant art is. So uh, let's go my presentation. Okay. okay, do you see my presentation full screen? Yes. Okay, okay. So, um, this moment cannot show. The author of this famous book, published for the first time in 1993, points out that migration and the resulting ethics and racial diversities are among the most emotive subjects in contemporary societies. These emotions and attitude intensify in the 21st century, another or the next century of migration. They also constitute political 
activities which for the grant such problems as a refuge crisis, religion wars, or problems or, or problems of identity. Many studies within the social sciences divide this into matters concentrating receiving uh, countries and societies and uh, immigrating societies. Let's have a look to the examples where uh, such long-term changes have taken uh, place and established as such an external and they gave rise to a new values. It such is, in my opinion, a distinctive migrant dramaturgy. Uh, Germany is at the best example as a country with the highest number of immigration in Europe. More than 22% of population are migrants. Hence, my research focuses on this specific culture area. The aim of my presentation is to demonstrate, based on some examples, the specific of dramaturgy of migrants. In my further research, I hope to be able to reveal a more systematic way centering dramaturgical or theatrical uh, strategies. In Germany, the problem of migrant theater and also the specific migrant dramaturgy has been an important and topical issue only for about um, 10 years. The problem of migrant and art, migrant team are not novelty in such areas as popular music or film. Let us recall the works of Fate Akin or Tebik Basel. We may say that theater has been quite deaf to the migrant team for many years. One black actor playing Otello in Castor's play does not really address the issue. 2010, a flagship theatrical text, Ferrictus Blut, Crazy Blut, was created by Nuram Erop and Jens Hille. The success of this performance for example, during Berliner Theater, Treffen, uh, Milheimer Theater, Tage, Radical Jung in Munich, has confirmed in this value and indicates the issue of migrant participation in cultural life of Germany, which is being pushed forward to this day. The play Crazy Blood adopts the main theme for drama film uh, Skirt Day 2008, directed and written by Jean-Paul Lillefeld. The story is about a teacher named Sonia, both in the original uh, and the adaptation, who works at school with children from migrant families. She is giving a hard time with discipline in the classroom, trying to follow the objectives of the curriculum and to bring the works of Friedrich Schiller and his idealistic vision of a classical German theater closer to her students. During Strager, a gun falls out of one of the students' pockets. The frustrated teachers grabs the gun and after the moment of hesitation, takes the students hostage. At gun point, she forced them to, the, to come to stage and perform extracts from Schiller's play, mostly the Roberts, because only the theater saved the world. Christiane Richter Nilsson described this strategy as hyperdrama, that is, drama engaging in dialogue with other dramas and argues that transtextual and transcultural transgressions give rise to a new dramatic genre or sub-genre. Crazy Blood is a drama which uh, complies uh, with Aristotelian units, time, place, and action. The play is divided into three acts, a prologue and epilogue. Hence, the quantitative components of classical tragedy are present. The stage direction, directions, however, bring to mind not Aristoteles, but another German playwright, Brecht. This is, of course, a technique used by Brecht and noted in model book, which serves to break with generic a convention of drama that is theatrical illusion. This dramaturgical strategy in Brecht's day, as well as now, is a shift of a center of a craving from the play itself to the spectator. Instead of feeling empathy, the spectator should critically analyze 
what they see on the stage. I show the stage directions. Uh, the spectators see how the actors change into costumes and take their position on stage. The most of slipping into a role is clearly indicated. The actor becomes one of the characters of the drama. There are kind uh, of objects for uh, projection of audience view. That undermines the classical aesthetic, which is free compassion and fear, and leads the spectator to catharsis, as we identify with the drama character. The aim of the actors and the characters where it is not built psychological, understable identity, but to critically investigate identities with the spectator attributes than with. That far is a confrontation of an um, alienated spectator with the problem of the teacher and terrorized student. It's also a confrontation of the um, creation with the material itself, seemingly outdated the students want to symbolically kill Schiller's classic. They not care what is um, repertoire theater, national theater, and do not pay attention to Schiller's letter on the aesthetic education of men, published in 1794. The idea of the authors, uh, Crazy Blood, is a reconstruction of Brecht's tactic in the focus on the audience. Is this feature characteristic of migrant theater? When we read how Hans T. Lehmann writes about Brecht, I mean um, Brecht Leisen, this book, works nowadays, uh, we uh, think it's not true. But we also have to realize that nowadays we view audience differently than it was except in Brecht's time. Brecht's theater since the times of Theater am Schiffbauerdam until a Berliner Ensemble was unfamiliar with the problem of an empty audience. Hence, Brecht's concepts rather aimed to renew or change the spectator's thinking. It's quite different nowadays in Germany. The empty audience is fact. Audience research, publicus forschung, or audience development are new fields in theater studies. It's also approach a culture policy. This diagnosis of a poor condition of German repertoire theater was quite justified by the lack of migrant participants. I propose a thesis that migrant theater is and its specific spectator-oriented dramaturgy is quite justified by the lack of migrant participants. I propose a thesis that migrant theater will develop in Germany where the turnout crisis occurred in hyper-artistic theater, which as studies show few cared about. An example of growing popularity of this new trend in the theater uh, is the theater of Maxim Gorky, so-called Gorky, which was ranked in the um, theater of the year 2013 and 2016, uh, by a monthly theater holder. Earlier also, Ballhaus Neustrasse, Berlin Center of Migrant Culture. The artistic director of this center and also um, uh, Gorky Theater is Shermin Ranhoff. Uh, what uh, interested the audience coming to the Ballhaus News and currently to the uh, Gorky uh, Theater? Shermin Ranhoff explained that critical questioning of the current narrative, new approach to the migrant problem. Sherman Langhoff not only legitimized its theater with her life, he also uh, conducted a widespread public debate. Langhoff introduced the term post-migrant in Germany discourse. She points out that we define the stories told by the second and third migrant generation differently from the stories of where Fathers. But Jens Hillier, who was the co artistic director of Gorky Theater, emphasized uh, that by creating space for migrant and post migrant works, they gained a uh, chance to create something that would represent Germanness in a completely different way. 
And the answer to this, to this challenge uh, can be found actually in dramaturgy. There is the in repertoire of Gorky theater. However, not only the Gorky theater using the dramaturgy of migrants, a good example might be Oleg Witt, a migrant of Polish origin. He is a creator of so-called Theater der Migranten. He does not necessarily write the text, but he creates them together with the participants of his theater projects. Um, Witt uh, refers to, uh, to biographies and participants who came from the whole world, Lebanon, Israel, Philippines, or Australia, in the text which is actually created after the show, different intercultural problems appear, such identity, feeling different or alienated. Um, which strategy can be included in the trend which Jana Merson and uh, Katrin Pevne write about their book, and this is dramaturgy of um, self. Multilingual theater praxis that reflected at everyday alienation experience migrants' theaters makes and their audiences. Similar to 2006, Günther Zenkel and Ferdinand Zainmogu present by Black Virgins, uh, that also in the Sherman Langhoff uh, Theater Festival, um, uh, his um, play, 10 Muslims, 10 women, 10 monologues. Uh, where the main topic, uh, as can be expected, expected the problems ranging from um, differences in food culture to problems of sexuality. Summarizing the examples of migrants' drama in the main elements include the first multilingualism uh, and the next the transcultural identity. And drama is staging as only during the show where contact with the spectator. Transtextual process also kill the robbers and the self presentation. Know that would be uh, it when it comes to current uh, research. Time will show uh, whether these compact strategies or only sensitivity of new generation and so or so-called society of singulars. This book is a scientific diagnosis of um, German or European society. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina, for your presentation. Uh, please don't go away, uh, because we have the we have established a sort of a practice that the questions come at the end of the session. So just stay on for a while. Do we have another presenter? Radka. Yeah, Radka is here. Dobrý den, Radka. Hello. Uh, Radka has worked at the Yamo Theater Academy in Brno, Czech Republic. And right now, she is a Maris Skłodowska Curie Research Fellow at the Institute of Theater Studies of the Freie Universität in Berlin. And uh, Radka is going to talk to us about the textual, the performative, and the political. So Radka, go ahead. Hello, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Please, can you hear me? Can you see me all right? Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this conference on drama in the last 20 years. It's very interesting for me to listen to your papers and the debates, even more so since I'm no expert in theory of drama in a sense of a play text. And in my up to now research, I've been rather dealing with the relation between theater and the society and a the role theater may play in the public sphere. For these reasons, I will rather focus on theatre and its performative dimension in my paper. Particularly, I will examine theatre, which deals with social and political issues, and in doing so, I will respond to the broader question of the conference about the tactics and strategies contemporary drama employs when faced with social challenges. In my presentation, I would like to briefly discuss the interrelation between the textual, the performative, and the political on stage. 
in the context of Czech documentary theater of the 2010s and with references to Erika Fischer-Lichte and Hanti Lehmann's theories. As a case study, I'm going to use a production of Mraki. And now please let me share my screen. Hope it's going to work like this, yes. And to share my presentation with you. And it goes like that, yes. The production I'm going to talk about was devised by the Prague-based experimental ensemble Handagote. And it was premiered in 2011 at the Alfred Vedvoje Maim Theatre in Prague. The production reflects upon various periods in the Czech history, including the Nazi occupation and the communist era, which are seen through the genealogy of one particular Czech family, a family of a performer, Veronika Schwabová, who is a member of Handa Gotte. The performance employs narration, family documents, authentic family objects, home video, film, music, dance, and new technologies. Thus, a subjective rhizomatic structure with specific subjective hierarchy is created, where memories occur in fragments and bizarre connections, as it happens in one's memory. Even though the clouds can easily be labeled a documentary theater, since it is based on a real family's history and often includes performing documents such as letters or family photographs, I will not analyze the production in the context of the documentary theater theory, which often discusses the issue of authenticity, etc. I will rather focus on the political dimension of the piece, which was, however, rather underrated in the theater reviews published on the production. Since the production oscillates between theater and ritual, and its performative dimension is emphasized, Erika Fischer-Lichter's reflection upon the performative aesthetics in theater will be included. Also, since the clouds features several attributes Lehmann described in his book on post-traumatic theater, the book we have discussed at the conference many times. Um, so in this production, there are these elements uh, or attributes as visual dramaturgy, non-hierarchy, physicality, interruption of the real and musicalization, and therefore, I will very briefly refer to Lehmann's view um, on the political in post-dramatic theatre in my paper. The political is involved in the production, especially when performing the family history during the Second World War and in the early 1950s. In these periods, Veronika Schwabová's family was highly exposed since her predecessors were members of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. Due to their political orientation, some of them were imprisoned by the Nazis and others imprisoned during a purge within the Communist Party in the early 1950s. To provide a specific example of how the political is performed on stage within the production, let me focus on the figure of Schwabová's grand uncle, Karel Schwab. He was one of the leading communist officials directing elimination of the political opponents. Since 1950, he worked as a deputy of the Minister for National Security, and according to some historians, he was a brutal sadist. Finally, he was charged with high treason in a show trial organized by a different fraction of the Communist Party and was executed. On stage, the performer introduces Karel Schwab employing a perspective of a child at first. She recollects information she heard about him from her grand grandfather and portrays Schwab as a victim of an unjust trial and an exemplary caring husband and father. The audience tends to accept such a portrait and believe in this victim narrative, since so far the performer portrayed he, her predecessors in a similar manner in the performance. Also, Karel Schwab is not well known in the public Czech discourse. In the next sequence, the performer switches to a perspective of an adult and informs the audience about her own research about Karel Schwab and its findings. She communicates them in a form of almost neutrally formulated sentences about her grand uncle's political activities, including brutality he used when interrogating prisoners. 
In doing so, she interrupts her speech by diving her head to a bucket, bucket filled with water, being on her knees. A camera is placed inside of the bucket and therefore we can see the performer's eyes open under the water, live projected on the screen placed above the stage. When speaking, the performer is almost out of breath, which strengthens the emotional tone of her speech, clearly revealing her sorrow, desperation and helplessness when facing the historical facts. The shocking and purely negative information historical information about Karel Schwab is thus conveyed by the text, or more precisely, by the performer's speech, while her physical action adds multiple other layers, both on the semiotic and material levels. Semiotically, we could interpret her action metaphorically in many ways. For instance, the water in the buckle may be seen as the past the performer is diving in and where she tries to orient herself. However, the past represented by the water is suffocating and becomes a source of her physical and psychological terror. Or alternatively, the presented physical action of diving into the buckle can be seen as a reference to the torturing techniques the performer's grand uncle used to apply since water has been a well-known tool of torture for centuries, etc. Following Fischerlichter's thought on material dimension of performance, we might differentiate a powerful impact of the performer's physical action on the spectators when we focus on her phenomenological body. Firstly, her slightly self-destructive physical behavior activates empathy, fear, and other emotions depending on the spectator's nature and employing the mirror neurons. And it, so it may also provoke a physical tension in a spectator. Even the materiality of the water and its potentially lethal effect on the human body can be felt by some spectators, perhaps. Thus, the audience is stimulated not only rationally and emotionally, but also physically, while the message about the crimes of the Communist Party is communicated at the discursive level. The situation created by Handa Goethe Ensemble is highly political, even though it doesn't include asserting any political view and is very distant to any agitprop theatre. Considering the Czech political context of the early 2010s, a decision of Veronika Švábová, the performer, to publicly claim allegiance to the members of the Communist Party, who were responsible for the most violent phase of the Czech communist past, was an unusual and brave deed, since the post-1989 dominating discourse has been strictly anti-communist. And it was even more brave since she publicly revealed the ambiguity of remembering the communist era in the Czech Republic, when a personal level often contradicts the social one, and which resonates with experience and family genealogies of many Czechs. This contradiction between the private and the social when remembering the communist past is emphasized by Schwabova at the very end of the scene. And you will just, in a second, you will see the whole scene. She switches back to the child's perspective and repeats the sentence, Karel was a caring father of his family, which gets a new meaning now that we know what kind of man he was. Quote, None of our family members had any idea what he was doing, end quote, she adds, as she, if she wanted to justify the affection her family had for Karel Schwab. The two sentences then sounds repetitively from the record, confronted with Karel's informal photo portrait projected above the stage. Then Schwab carries the buckle away from the central stage as if she takes out the rubbish. And when she come ba comes back, it's completely dark. She jumps and the camera captures and projects a still picture of her luminous silhouette on the black background. The silhouette looks like a hanged figure, reminding us of the brutal end of the performer's grand uncle. And now let's watch the scene, hopefully. Mi děda Ruda vyprávěl, že jeho Karla, že jeho bratra Karla mu 
učili, že, že mu nedávali jíst, že mu nenechávali spát a že mu svítili lampičkou do očí. A že jeho bratra nespravedlivě popravili. Já jsem tomu vůbec nerozuměla. číst a pátrala jsem, co vlastně Karel dělal. Karel byl šéfem komunistické spravodajské služby. Měl pod sebou několik tisíc agentů, kteří se infiltrovali do jiných politických stran, do církve, do armády, prostě úplně všude. Děda, 
Mira, pero yo ni en el mío. Te vi que te lleva a hablar. Pero Freddy, ¿a qué proviene? Mira, pero yo ni en el mío. Con el chico te lleva a hablar. Pero Freddy, ¿a qué proviene? Mira, pero yo ni en el mío. Con el chico te lleva a hablar. Pero Freddy, ¿a qué proviene? Mira, pero yo ni en el mío. Con el chico te lleva a hablar. After watching this scene, one might ask, how is it political? On the one hand, we could agree with Fischer Lichter, who argues that the mere co-presence of performers and spectators during a performance is a political act. However, this statement seems too general when trying to describe the political dimension of the clouds. We can see that the political in the scene emerges as a result of a complex interplay between at least four factors. Various aesthetic strategies, working both on the semiotic and material levels, co-presence of the performer and the spectators, past political reality, and the current political context of the time. Still, it's not easy to discursively grasp the nature of the, the political generated within the performance. Hans de Slehmann argues that, quote, the political has in an effect in the theatre if, and only if, it is in no way translatable or retranslatable into the logic, syntax, and terminology of the political discourse of social reality, end quote. And this is probably the case of the clouds. They activate our perception of the social issues while intensely stimulating our most private memories, associations, and emotions, without providing any discursive claims or conclusions. And thus, the political keeps its effective power as well as its elusiveness and ambiguity. Thank you. Thank you, Radka. Thank you for this uh, well-illustrated talk. Uh, hang on for the questions, but because we still have a, a presentation between the, the questions and, and, and now. Uh, and now I'd like to invite, again, a collective effort, uh, I mean, a presentation of collective effort by Simona Hammer, Jera Evans, Kim Komlans, and Simona Semenich, uh, with the title, A Report from the Frontline. So I hope all of you are here, which is wonderful. I'm going to move away so you can sit here and, and enjoy the place. So. Yeah, 
גם אותי גם. מיקרופון. V imenu dram, v imenu enote dramskih pisateljic in pisateljev, ki delujejo v okviru ZDUSA, bi se rade zahvalile vodi simpozija, kajšper jutrohi, slogi, AGRFT in amfiteatru, ter vsem sodelujočim za vaše prispevke in debate. Enota dramskih pisateljic in pisateljev od leta 2018 aktivno deluje na področjih izboljševanja ustvarjalnih okoliščin, delovnih pogojev in pogodbenih razmeri, širjenja izobraževalnih in poklicnih priložnosti, informiranja in ozaveščanja javnosti in članstva ter drugih sodobno slovensko dramatiko povezanih področjih. V pričujočem poročilu s fronte želimo opozoriti na prepogost neprofesionalen in ignorantski odnos gledaliških povstvarjavcev, moški spolje v celotnem prispevku uporabljen kot generični spolj, do sodobne slovenske dramatike in dramskih avtorjev v slovenskem gledališkem prostoru. Primere dobrih praks smo zato namenoma izpustili. V prispevku so uporabljene resnične izkušnje 21 nagrajevanih in uprizarjanih avtorjev. Njihova pričevanja so anonimizirana. Pišeš. Pisati zna vsak, nauči se že v prvem razredu osnovne šole, ampak pisanje dramatike zahteva posebne veščine. Ni toliko pisanje, je bolj zgoščevanje, fino tkanje. Pišeš. Mesece in mesece se pogabljaš v like, situacije, dogajanje. Razmišljaš o kontekstu, podtekstu, sporočilu. O formi, jeziku, strukturi. O uprizoritvenem segmentu. Pišeš, popravljaš, piliš, brusiš. Ko je tekst končan, ga pošleš v gledališče. Potem čakaš. 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 Pošleš prijazen opomnik. Čakaš. Pišem. Pišeš. Vrišem. Čakaš. Popravljaš. Pišem. Razmišljam. Pišem. Čakam. Kako se odzvati? Se ne odzoveš. Se odzoveš in obljubiš, da boš besedilo prebral. Se odzoveš, po pol leta besedilo zavrneš, brez argumentov, zato nimaš časa. Se z avtorjem dobiš na sestanku in mu pojasniš svojo umetniško vizijo. Veš, jaz, ko dobim v roke tekst, se odločam instinktivno. Tako je vem, ali je mhm, ali mhm. Slovenski dramatik pri telefonu, prosim. Naročilo dramskega besedila. Bi šlo v dveh meseci. Rabi meno žensko zasedbo. Kakšen napotek? Ne, ne, samo da ne bodo igravci goli. Pa, a lahko brez tistih tvojih didaskali? Ob naročilu ne dobim nobenih navodil, razen zagotovila, da lahko pišem o čemrkoli želim, besedilo oddam do roka določenega v pogodbi, na to pa mi vodstvo noče izplačati honorarja, če je zato ni to, kar so pričakovali. Režiser me povabi, da naredim dramatizacijo. Gledališču dostavim koncept in spišem utemeljitev projekta za Ministrstvo za kulturo, do sestanka z direktorjem pa nikakor ne pride. Ne odgovarja na maile. V gledališču mi zagotovijo, da bo pogodba in postavke v njej jasne, ko se začnejo vaje. 
besedilo je skoraj končano, režiser je zadovoljen do začetka vajna sloči nekaj tednov, ko izvem, da zaradi neurejenih avtorskih pravic za uporabo izvirnika moje dramatizacije ne bodo sprejeli. Brez pogodbe ne morem nič. Sodelovanja ni. Čeprav je vas čas jasno, kdo bo režiral moje novo nastajajoče besedilo, me režiser niti enkrat ne povabi na sestanek, ne komentira končne verzije besedila, niti se name ne obrne med procesom vaj. Globoko v procesu pisanja pred oblikovanjem zadnje različice se dobim z režiserjem. Ko pridem na sestanek, ima pred seboj odprt tekst na prvi strani. Nisem še prebral, reče. Daj mi pet minut. Režiser hoče brati že vse osnutke in prve verzije prizorov in se vmešavati s svojimi idejami in popravki. Njegovo nerazumevanje kreativnega procesa vodi do zmede in nelagodja. Režiser me povabi na sestanek, da bi se pogovorila o mojem tekstu. Polovico sestanka mi razlaga o nekem drugem tekstu, ki ga je zares želel delati, pa ga direktor ni sprejel. Potem se pogovarjava o tem, kako ni kjer ne dobi zadelati. Potem je sestanka konec. Režiser mi poveda, da želi v krstni v prizoritvi črtati eno izmed zgodbovnih linij, ker ga ta del ne zanima. Prav tako ga ne zanima moja obrozložitev strukture, dramaturgije in ideje teksta. Gledališče odkupi besedilo za 20 igravcev, za velik udar, na to pa postavijo na male modru s štirimi igravci. Za gledališče sem po naročilu napisal besedilo, v katerem ima pomembno vlogo zbor. Zbor je brez pojasnila iz uprizoritve izostal. Napišem kratko dramo, monolog, katerega v srednji smisel je, da je dramska oseba sam. Ko dam besedilo, se ponudim, da lahko po potrebi besedilo dopišem, spremenim, sodelujem pri črtanju. Nihče me ne pokliče, mi ne piše, nihče niti ne potrdi, da so oddano besedilo prejeli. Vaje se začnejo in končajo. Poustvarjalna ekipa v procesu vaju monolog doda še eno osebo. Pozabijo me povabiti. Mene tudi. Jaz prvi dve vaj vodim sam, ker ima režiser druge obveznosti. Sedim za mizo na prvi in moj zadnji vaj. Nihče me ne upa pogledati v oči. Po uvodnem govoru režiserja besedo predajo meni, da povem, kako je besedilo nastajalo. Nihče me nič ne sprašuje o podrobnostih. Nekako je čutiti, da si vsi želijo, da bi čim prej zapustil prostor. Gledajo v besedila, eni šilijo svinčnike, nekateri rišejo rožice, drugi pogledujejo na ekran telefončka. Počutim se odveč, ne zaželen. Morda jih je le strah, pomislim. Morda imajo le tremo pred mano. Se razumem, pisti smo težki. Morda se bojijo, da jim ne bi dovolil delati črt, da bi jim delal težave. Morda jim ne bi hotel dovoliti preoblikovati celote. Tudi vse smo ljudje gledališča, vse vemo, da ima odr svoje zakonitosti, da so nekatere reči neobhodne. Zakaj me nihče nič ne vpraša? Dobim se z režiserjem. Tekst ne funkcionira. Kako, a jezikovno? Ne, ne, v celoti. Čim smo šli v prostor, mi je postali jasno, da ne funkcionira, nič se ne zgodi. No, kar precej se zgodi. Glej, ne funkcionira, mi smo to probali, ne gre. Kaj ste probali? Ja, tako, v prostoru. Aha, a to na obeh vajah prejšnji teden? Ja, dva dni smo se matrali, pa ne funkcionira. Kaj pa? Glej, daj ti napiš to malo drgače. Ker na papirju je meni dobro zgledalo, vse super. A ko si prebral, si pa nisi predstavljal, kako bi to v prostor postavil? Se se ne da, ne funkcionira. Aha, ampak jaz sem, ojš, 
mesece in mesec. Ne funkcionira. Koliko kaj si rekel, da ste imeli? Med procesom vajme zasedajo v vlogo hvaležnega mrtvega avtorja in tako nimam stikov z ekipo. Tudi jaz ne. Čeprav se ponudim, da me lahko kadarkoli pokličejo, da lahko še kaj popravim, da sem jim na razpolago. Režiser me pokliče po drugi vaj in prosi naj znano pesem v tujem jeziku, ki sem jo v tekstu uporabil kot citat, prevedem v slovenščino. Dramaturgu in režiserju pošljem dolgo obrazložitev, zakaj tega ne morem storiti in ponudim nekaj smiselnih dramaturških rešitev. Odziva ni. O tiskovki berem v medijih. Jaz tudi. In vi ste? Avtor besedila. Novina, ki se obrne in odide. Jaz smo se zmotli, dajmo še enkrat. Pardon, jaz sem kriva. Jaz sem kriva. Od začetka, o tiskovki berem v medijih. O tiskovki berem v medijih. Jaz tudi. Novinarka ne sme jano pristopi. In vi ste? Avtor besedile. Novinarka se obrne in odide. Iz kupiček pet intervjujev z igravci, v katerih ima avtorstvo novinarka ponoložil na ročje. Kdaj pa se je porodil lik? V objavah krstne oprizoritve na družabnih omrežjih me gledališče ne navaja kot avtorja. V programski knjižici je kup napačnih informacij o vsebini teksta. V gledališkem listu ni nobenega prispevka, ki bi se ukvarjal z mojim tekstom. Vsi avtori pišejo o izvorni zgodbi, ki pa je bila zame zgolj izhodišče za ponoven premislek. Na podelitvi nagrade predstavi navedejo zgolj mi režiserja. V oddaji o gledališču na nacionalni televiziji v napovedi krstne uprizoritve kot avtorja ne navedejo dramatika, ampak režiserja. Stanovsko društvo večkrat opozori na nepravilnost, vendar brez učinka. Na generalko me ne povabijo. Me je tudi ne. Na generalki vidim, da so ščrtali 40% mojega besedila, ne da bi se kdo o tem posvetoval z mano. Še dobro, da sem šel na generalko, sicer bi me na premijeri kap. Po generalki napišem pesem z naslovom. Gledališka teorija se prizadeva, da bi dramatika nadomestila z globalnim subjektom, kolektivnim izjavljalcem, svojvrstnim ekvivalentom za pripovedovalca v romanesknem besedilu. Igralec se slika, režiser upije, pisatelj joka. Na premijero nisem šel, niso me povabili. Pozabijo me povabiti na premijero, zato jih kličem, se predstavim in prosim zagrati s vstopnico. Blagajnik me vpraša, kdo ste pa vi? Šele na premijeri vidim, da so ščrtali predvsej še nko zbesedila, spremenili dramaturgijo in tako izmaličili idejo teksta. Povabljen sem k pisanju dramatizacije. Režiser rabi pol leta, da prebere roman in tri mesece, da prebere mojo dramatizacijo, na katero nima pripomp. Na to se med procesom vaj očitno odloči, da ga zanima bolj raziskovalni pristop. Šele na premijeri vidim, da na odru ni moja dramatizacija, ampak na paberkovano tekstovno skropucalo polno osnovnih dramskih in gledaliških napak. Kot avtor te katastrofe pa sem še vedno naveden, jaz. Pozabijo me poklicat na poklon. Mene tudi. Tudi mene. Isto, ampak še dobro. Fotograf slika ekipo, pristopim, a me spodi stran. Na svojo veliko srečo se premijere nisem mogel udeležiti in sem prišel šele na prvo ponovitev. Prišel sem s partnerko, ki me je morala že po prvih minutah vleči nazaj na sedež in miriti, saj od moje dramatizacije ni ostalo popolnoma nič. Še hujše je bilo to, da ni popolnoma nič ostalo niti od proznega izvirnika. Ko je bilo predstave končno konec, je sledil aplavz, po katerem so mi znanci čestitali in me hvalili. Bilo je res za znored in je še najbolj spominjalo na kakšne res neprijetne sanje. 
Edina srečna okoliščina pri vsem skupaj je bila ta, da je bila moja dramatizacija objavljena v gledališkem listu. Pa seveda tudi ta, da režiserja ni bilo blizu in da ga tudi potem dolga leta nisem srečal. In še takrat, ko sem po nekaj letih naletel nan, je ravno telefoniral, tako da se nama ni bilo treba pogovarjati. V krstni oprizoritvi so spremenili konec, zato je poanta besedila vsebinsko okrnjena. Predstava kljub temu funkcionira. Kritik v oceni predstave se suje s poročilnost besedila, ne da bi besedilo, ki je sicer objavljeno v gledališkem listu, sploh prebral. Ekipa oprizoritve dopiše prizore, kritik kritizira tekst, ne da bi opazil, da kritiziranje odlomki sploh niso moji. Kritik želi prebrati besedilo, da bi lahko pisal tudi o odnosu prizoritve do mojega teksta, pa mu gledališče besedila noče poslati. Pišem. Še vedno. Vsem v navkljub. Pišem. Dram že nekaj časa ne pišem več, samo še romane. Pišem, popravljam, mesece in mesece, leta. Pisanju sem se pa vsem odpovedal. Pišem. Iščem službo. Pišem. To je bilo poročilo s fronte. Uporabili smo resnične izkušnje 21 nagrajevanih in uprizarjanih avtorjev. Primere dobrih praks smo namenoma izpustili. V enoti dramskih pisateljic in pisateljev Združenja dramskih umetnikov Slovenije si na različne načine prizadevamo pozivati vodstva gledališč, ustvarjavce, teoretike in pedagoge k spodbujanju dramske ustvarjalnosti. Zauzemamo se za skrb za razvoj, uprizarjanje in izdajanje izvirnih slovenskih dramskih besedil. Zaščito avtorskih pravic in izobraževanje strokovne in splošne javnosti o avtorskih in sorodnih pravicah. O zaveščanje o nujnem dodatnem financiranju prevodov sodobne slovenske dramatike v tuje jezike in načrtno promocijo v tujini. Promocijo sodobne slovenske dramatike v splošni javnosti tudi s pomočjo dodatnih nagrad in razpisov za izvirna dramska besedila. Spodbojanje raznorodne dramske pisave in različnih uprizoritvenih formatov. Okrepitev dramaturških oddelkov institucionalnih gledališč strokovnjaki iz področja razvoja dramskih besedil. Za izobraževanje o sodobnih dramskih pisavah in delu z njimi za režiserje in ostale povstvarjavci. Spodbujanje akademskega diskurza o sodobni slovenski dramatiki. Vključevanje študijskih dramskih besedil študentov AGRFT v redne študijske produkcije. In to je šele začetek. Tukaj ni bilo niti ene točke, ki je ne bi mogli podpisati z obema rokama in še več. In moram reči, da je bilo za me nekako sveže in zanimivo videti pogled tudi seveda z avtorske strani na to osredno točko ustvarjanja pravzaprav gledaliških predstav in enostavno videti izkušnje, ki jih včasih ali pa pogosto, o katerih se bom rekel kot gledalc pogosto sprašujem tudi sam. Tako da to je bilo, moram reči, več kot oči odpirajoče in zanimivo. Zdaj pa, well, I have to switch back to English. I'm going to invite the podium and our listeners to pose the questions to our presenters. All of them, meaning, well, Jure, we have dealt with the presentation already. That means Karolina, Radka and the um, the quartet of the, uh, of, you know, the, of the authors. 
Are there any questions, please? Well, if not, then let me just break the, the ice, so to speak, warm a little bit. Uh, Radka, I would have a question for you. Uh, namely, you were talking about this politicality or political dimension of um, the, uh, the Meraki show. Uh, and what actually would interest me is the reaction, or if you could sub uh, somehow subsume the reaction of the uh, Czech public. Did they understand the play as, let's say, personal, dealing with the unpleasant political past, or could it transcend into, you know, the uh, the discourse about communism in Czech Republic as such? So, what did the performer manage to accomplish, so to speak? said uh, the production was mostly perceived as the personal story on this private level. So uh, this political layer and especially the communist past was present in many ways. Also, since the performer uh, referred to her great, great grandfather, who was um, a social democrat in the late 19th century and uh, became a um, and so she emphasized the connection between the social democratic efforts and the communist and the continuity between the social democratic efforts in the late 19th century and the early 20th century and the communist party. So it was there on um, even more than I showed, but I don't think that the audience is really um, focused on this layer. So like I said, I think, uh, the perception of this layer was very limited and perhaps also because the the aesthetic form of the production is very powerful it wasn't visible in the video i showed you that was simple but you might see the photos where these silhouettes and the the projection technology was used much more and therefore also maybe the political was a little bit um yeah down down Downplayed, maybe. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Well, then perhaps to Carolina. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank za autorce. English. English. Okay. Um, um, my question would be, uh, you said that you intentionally left out all the good examples. Um, I just um, want you to comment a little bit or reveal the, the good examples, because I remember that around 2010, a little bit before, we were talking what's happening with Slovene drama. We have only dramatizations, you remember the... the, the all the big uh, Dostoevsky's novels that uh, were staged in drama. But today, the situation nevertheless seems different. There are many authors' uh, works uh, written, presented, um, uh, commissioned for, for the theaters. So there is a change. I, I do agree with all the, the, the situations that you presented so um, clearly. Uh, but uh, are there any good examples and are they sort of uh, more common in the last years or not? I think, I think our focus was mainly on, um, so not so much on presenting the quantity, but the quality of the experience for, for a living author. Um, the other thing was that, um, to be honest, the good examples that we did receive from the from the association, because we actually did a poll in the um, Slovenian Association of Dramatic Artists, um, and it, what we did receive were a couple of examples from abroad, from um, authors having their plays staged abroad, um, a couple of examples of people who staged their own, so who are also directors, who staged their own plays, and um, some positive examples of um, authors whose first experience it was to have a play staged. 
um, which is, I think, one of the reasons why we decided to exclude them, because it would be a bit, my, maybe too didactic. <laughs> Did you want to say something? Yes, I will just add, of course, we, we, uh, we do acknowledge the changes, the positive changes in the last 10 years, starting with uh, playwriting being taught at the academy and so on and so on. So I think this is a very, very important, uh, uh, important progress has been made. The question only is how can we develop further? We have all the things that we uh, listed as possibilities are already being introduced in one or another form in Slovenian theatres, also in institutional theatres, not just like in, in NGOs. But maybe now it's time to um, strategically think what can we do to support uh, emerging playwrights, young authors, then different types, different forms of playwriting, different types of theater. And of course, how can now theater, who we all kind of sense, at least in Slovenia, is falling a little bit behind, how can theater or other theater practitioners um, um, get maybe uh, or or uh, at least try to get um, uh, s some proper education let me use this term to better understand to better uh, support and to better transform all this di diversity of place on 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 stage so it's all right then there are more questions of course for the for the the last uh, presentation i guess uh, Jura Gantar, of course, is asking, is the introduction of the profession of theatre director in the 19th century theatre responsible for the crisis of drama? What do you think? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your suggestion then, if I may provoke you a little bit? If I may poke you? <laughs> No, I think I think it's not um, it's not quite as confrontative as that. But the fact is that I think going back to the question that was asked before, um, it's it's not only about the quantity of the plays, Slovenian plays that we see on stage. It's about the quality of the process, and this is what our focus was. This is what we tried to bring out. And though we do have at the academy uh, in Ljubljana now um, one module where um, you know playwriting is taught. Um, w there are still no taught um, modules for directors on how to put on the first um, staging of a play, which is crucial. So the, appro the directorial approach is um, similar to when you're staging a classic or when you're staging a new writing uh, piece. Yeah, perhaps I'm afraid the Theatre Academy would disagree with that opinion. Okay, there is another question. Uh, by Tiasha Misle, and the, I'm just going to read it in Slovenian. Zakaj menite, da smo dramatiki pri nas pogosto ločeni od ustvarjalnega procesa v gledališču? Zakaj nimamo nekih ustvarjalnih kolektivov, kjer bi skupaj delali režiseri, dramatiki, igravci, dramaturgi, ki bi se lahko lahko bolj povezali in delali v sinergiji? Mislim, da je bil odgovor, mogoče že celo podan v naši ja. prezentaciji. Zakaj me nihče nič ne vpraša? Je bil eno citato. Pa mogoče sem še to, gledališki proces, se mi zdi, je vsakič znova tako zelo specifičen in čist logično je, da ne rata vsakič, da imamo vsi pač neke slabše izkušnje ali pa neuspele procese, iz katerih se lahko pač ogromno naučimo. Vprašanje je mogoče sam v času in v pozornosti, ki se namenja temu segmentu, da preden se štarta ali v prizoritev ali naročilo ali neka kolektivna gledališka praksa v prizarjanje nečesa, da se vsej na začetku postavi vprašanje, kdo, s kom, na kakšen način, kje. Se mi zdi, da tukaj zelo hitro umanka en premislek, ker smo zelo navajeni na nek standardni produkcijski model. Tle bi se lahko tudi navezali, včeraj mislim, da je bilo govora tudi o tej svobodi, o tekstu osvobojenem od gledališča in gledališču osvobojenem od teksta in kaj nam zdaj ostane. In mislim, da 
ne, pozabljamo v gledališču, da je svoboda tudi odgovornost. Vse o tem se danes veliko govori, ampak v gledališču pa zelo premal. Mislim, da je ta svoboda gledališča, ki si ga jemlja od teksta, pač neodgovorna. To. Mislim, da je razlog, da manjka empatije pri gledaliških ustvarjavcih, da se enostavno, vse ste videli tudi iz prezentacije, ne bere več tekstov, ne skuša več. Recimo, če rečemo, da je bil Korun pri nas prvi, kaj je tako prelom na redu, ampak on je skušal tekstu vendar le priti do dna, ga prebrati drugače. Danes pa ne govorimo več o tem, kako režiser in tekst prebere, ampak kako ga po svoje postavo. Ja, jaz bi tudi rajše po slovensko, konkr bom lahko. Zdaj, mislim, tako malo se mi zdi, da smo enoznačni, no se mi zdi, da pač stvar je nekje v mes. Mislim, jaz osebno težko karkoli izrekam, ker sem bila v bistvu v tako različnih nekje procesih in v različnih situacijah, ki so bile lahko super, potem nekatere druge malo slabše. Ampak predvsem se mi zdi, tudi kar se tega tiče sodelovanja in vsega tega, da je tu ta problem širši, veliko širši, pač da smo spet tukaj nekje pri nekem, ne vem, kapitalističnem mehanizmu, kjer proces ni bistven, bistven je produkt, da imamo rajši kot štiri temeljite procese, narediti 20 procesov na sezono, da imamo 20 premijer, kar seveda pomeni neizogibno to, da se tekstov ne bere, da se ne vlaga od časa v branje, kot ga je omenila Jera. In potem to potegne eno z drugim. Kar naenkrat smo na nasprotnih polih, eno je avtor, je na enem polu, moški spol uporabljam kot generični spol, režiser je na drugem polu in pač namesto, da bi se zgodila sinergija, kako pravi tjaša, se dogaja nek mimo hod, neka mimo bežnost. Še eno stvar sem hotla, ampak se mi zdi, da sem jo pozabila. Ok, ja, hvala vse vse vse. Vsem vse 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 Well, let me just put it stupid question. Namely, would it be possible, because we listen just to the, as you said, bad practices of, you know, cases of authors coming into to the theaters, would it be possible to quantify, let's say, the good versus the bad? I mean, are we talking about like 90% of bad examples and 10 good? Or what would be your feeling of still, you know, a few things that, going on in, in, in the correct way. It's not that I want to whitewash the entire process or anything. I'm just sort of wondering if everything is, is as bleak as you portrayed it or is perhaps there is still some, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. And the 10 good percent is my uh, experience. I see. Well, that's not too optimistic. No, no not that, 10 years ago. Right. Right, I see. And perhaps one might add uh, what you said about the process. In theater, I guess it's quite different if you stage a play that was staged before in, in I don't know, in a foreign context, it's finished in a way, or you're dealing with the with the uh, premiere, so with the first production where the the possibility of involvement in the text uh, is is much greater. And it's 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 the necessity. In this way, I believe that uh, the playwrights are developed, and uh, this is how it was done, even with Jovanovic or Kurun, as you said, and so on. So um, I think this is something that that the Slovenian theaters should really think about, and this is the positive examples I think with what Simona was telling about. Uh, sometimes this is happening, uh, and should happen much more, I guess. 
Maybe just to point out, the antagon antagonism isn't just between the director and the playwright. There's there's a third person in the room, which I think doesn't get mentioned enough, which is the dramaturg. And because some of the writers in Slovenia, or a lot of the writers, are, are dramaturgs themselves, um, they often act as acting dramaturgs for their own plays. Um, and that kind of mud muddies the waters as well, I think. So I think there's the, the question of the role of the dramaturg with new writing in Slovenia is a big one. So how do we um, educate enough people on how to work with a living writer in the room with the script that's still, as you say, being developed as it's being produced and so on. So I think there's, you know, I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to sound like we were, you know, we're just antagonizing the directors. Um, obviously, the, there there was some done for comic effect, but it's all based on um, testimonials. So. I see, but in terms of, uh, as you, Gashpur, said, you know, uh, texts that had been previously staged, I don't think even Shakespeare is safe from, you know, dealing with or, or playing with in, on the Slovenian stages. So, yeah, right. I, I, th I think the key word here, not being safe, it's not about keeping the script safe. We don't want to keep, keep the script f safe. That's not the message. The message in the script needs to be, you know, it, it, it needs to develop and open up. And that's the whole, that's, that's what we're trying to point the direction to. Okay, good point. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Because if not, then I'm still continue with one for Carolina. Are you there? <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay, so Carolina. I have the acoustic problem, but okay. perhaps that will be okay. I'm going to talk slowly and clearly. Um, yes. My question t would be regarding this migra um, migrant theater. To what extent does the self-presentation commingle or get covered with or, or get in the way of the content? How much are they connected because it seems to me that this migrant self-presentation is i mean the content the plot is actually what this self-presentation is all about am so, i correct or not okay i think that this um these techniques this uh, uh strategy self-presentation this is um this is very easy presentation i think and so uh I read only these two dramas. Uh, this drama about um, about uh, uh, these ten uh, Muslims women and uh, this, the the text of uh, performance uh, in uh, Oleg Vit uh, Theater. I think there is that this strategy, uh, self uh, dramaturgy of uh, of self, that was I think that was the first strategy in this whole. Uh, nowadays, a uh, migrant theater. But uh, I think that nowadays we have uh, interesting this transtextual or or another um, strategies. And uh, so um, there is also in in migrant uh, literature this this, this uh, self presentation is uh, was the first point in this. Uh, I think so in this in this genre on this in this subgenre and. Uh, but I don't know that it's very interesting. I think that that will be more interesting as uh, as I saw this in in, in these uh, dramas. Okay, thank you. Any uh, more questions by any chance? No. Okay, then thank you very much, uh, all the presenters, two ladies across the airwaves and or you know, the computer and the four presenters today here present in Ljubljana. So thank you very much and it's time for coffee break.